Becky with West Island News, and I'm here with Dr. Farah Alibe, a systems engineer at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. How are you doing today, Farah? I'm doing great. Great. Thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, thank so, you for having me. Absolutely. Um, I'm curious, were there any female figures who you looked up to that you could remember as a child? Um, so, so growing up, I mean, you know, the, the women in my family are, were very strong women and I, I've always been very, very close to my grandmother. She, you know, she grew up in Madagascar, um, you know, right at the turn of the Second World War and um, brought up a family that was civil unrest in Madagascar, moved with her husband to a brand new country, you know, to Canada um, and to give her children uh, a better chance at, at, at you know, at safety and, and life and education. And, and she sacrificed so much. I think she's always been the, uh, the example of a strong woman to me. Yeah. Um, so certainly she's, you know, she's been the, the greatest inspiration of my life. Um, in terms of women in STEM, that's something that that took a little bit longer for me to have. I have to admit that growing up, you know, I loved space. I mean, one of the movies that that um, inspired me to work in aerospace was the movie Apollo 13. But, you know, as you know, that movie mostly has a, a lot of white men. That, that was a demographic at NASA at the time. Um, so it, it actually took me a while to to figure out that there was a place for people like me at NASA because I didn't see that representation. I didn't even allow myself really to dream um, because I, I didn't know that there was a place for someone like me here. Um, and that, I think that really speaks to the importance of, of representation. I mean, we always talk about that in, in generic words, but here's one story, right? Where, where, gen, where representation could have perhaps helped me figure out a little bit earlier what my path could be and, and feel that this could be a path for me. Absolutely. It's a beautiful thing. And I know you're so involved with trying to hold the door open with community outreach. Um, are you currently involved in any programs? Um, so right now I'm, I'm very busy with, uh, with Mars. Um, so, yeah. uh, you know, the rover landed just a couple of weeks ago. I am still, um, I do participate in the Big Brother Big Sister program in Los Angeles. So I have a little sister who, uh, who I've been mentoring now for um, for three, four years, uh, wow. four, five years. Uh, gosh, it's been forever. I mean, and it, that has been a, a wonderful experience. I also mm -hmm. volunteer at a as um, a court ad, uh, uh, a special advocate for the courts here in in LA. So in um, in the foster care system, helping mm -hmm. children in the foster care system navigate that system, and and I, I navigate a child through that too. In addition to sort of given talks, taking the time to, to, yeah. to answer phone calls when people come knocking. It's, it's really important to me to, to give back to the community that helped me get to where I am. Absolutely, it's beautiful to see other people holding the door open. And now what inspired you to pursue this career in STEM? Because I know, like you said, you didn't have quite the same like big sister per se to look up to. Yeah, so I mean, I growing up, I was always sort of tinkering and, and breaking everything. My, my dad was an engineer, so I learned a lot from him. I remember he would, you know, there was no gender stereotypes in my house. So, um, and that's something that I'm very grateful for. My dad, you know, if, if he was repairing the car, I'd be the one there with him, needed to change a tire, I'd be there or, you know, fix something. I learned a lot from him. And I think that's where yeah. a lot of my curiosity and and ingenuity came from. Um, it took me a while to put two and two together, right? That, oh, I love space and I like tinkering, like engineering is, yeah. is something that I can do. But once I did, and once I discovered that that was a path, it all kind of clicked, right? That, yeah. wow, this is actually, this works with my brain. This is what I want to do. But even then I remember telling a teacher, this was, I was 16 when I realized that was my path. And, mm -hmm. um, I remember, you know, sitting down with the, the career advisor and being like, yeah, I think I want to be an engineer. You know, um, I've been thinking about other careers too, but I think this is what I want to do. And they, they answered, I remember the answer. They were like, well, you know, that's a male dominated field, you know, not sure if you're going to succeed there. And I was like, what? <laughs> uh, and I turned around and I was like, no, 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 let me show you. Um, and so, um, <laughs> um, so I don't know where this person is now, but I guess I showed them. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, so, you know, and, but, but again, you know, that was the moment I remember because for me, my personality was like, oh, if someone tells me I can't do something, I'm going to go do it. But, but that's not necessarily what we, you know, how everyone reacts. And, and, you know, I always say, we don't, we don't really encourage young girls 
to be engineers, where we tell them, oh, yeah. you should be a doctor, you should be a teacher, you should be, which are great careers, but we never say, oh, you should be an engineer, you should be a coder, you should be an astronaut. Uh, yeah. And so part of what I try to do by coming out and speaking about these things is, is encouraging people to, to see those roles as potentially being filled by anyone, right? Yeah. Regardless of your gender, regardless of who you are and where you come from. Absolutely, it's such an important thing. And now, say for the, the people that are currently going through that, the younger generation, what words of wisdom do you have for, for those people who may be facing the same struggles that you experienced? So, I mean, I can tell you that, you know, my, my journey was not a straight path. It, no one's is. And, and yeah. you know, you, you, see the, you see a lot of these stories of success, but we don't really talk about the failures along the way, right? Yeah. The amount of time I've applied for internships was turned down. I failed exams. I remember my first year of university was like awful. <laughs> I went home after my first semester crying that I would never make it, right? The, everyone has had hurdles. What I can tell you is if you have a dream, pick yourself up when you have those 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 stumbles. You know, find allies, find the energy, the force to get yourself back up and try again. Uh, if someone tells you no, ask again until someone tells you yes, because it it only takes one door, it only takes one opening for you to end up where you need to be. Right? I only needed one job offer, not exactly. ten, to be here. Um, yeah. So so that's that's what I like to remind folks is is you know don't fool yourself from from what you're seeing you know the the glitz that you're seeing when when people are lighting things on mars right every yeah. single one of us have had their own our own struggle to get here exactly. um and and there's a path for you and there's a place for you yes yeah you don't always see this like you said the struggles the lead up to that it didn't just happen overnight and now since you have been working with nasa what do you think would be some of the most valuable insights that you've learned just throughout your experiences, um, I mean it's it's been a it's been an incredible journey to get here. I have to tell you that you know, working in any field, I think what I've learned and from the happiness that I've had in the past few years in my mm -hmm. career is that my biggest insight or thing that I want to share is that is that you should you know if you're looking for your career if you're looking for that path, pick the thing that you're curious about, pick the thing that yeah. you're passionate about, right? Take that and figure out how to make it into a job. And Absolutely. it's gonna make your life so much better. Uh, I mean, I get paid to drive a rover on Mars. Like what? Um, and, and, but, awesome. you know, and, it, <laughs> and it doesn't matter, you know, of course, Mars is cool and the space is cool and you should come do it, but you know, that might not be your passion, yeah. but, but whatever that passion is, don't, you know, often we are prescribed certain paths, but uh, but, you know, take a step back, figure out what it is and, and make that into your career. Um, and it's going to bring you so much more happiness and fulfillment than, uh, uh, than, you know, trying to, trying to follow the path that you think society has for you. Absolutely. It's so important. We all need to fan that, that flame, that fire within us. So many beautiful things come from that. And now you are a part of such an amazing part of history right now. What does it feel like? to be a part of history in the making, you know, what kind of thoughts are going through your head as you touch down on Mars? You know, what emotions <laughs> are you feeling as part of this like groundbreaking astrobiological mission? That's just an insane. It's like so exciting, I can imagine. I mean, it's incredible. Um, yeah. uh, you know, I get, I get to be part of the team that, that, yeah, that makes history. It is incredibly humbling. I think every time I have a chance to take that step back and look at the amazing team that put this rover together. I mean, we're literally mm -hmm. talking about thousands of people that have put, you know, hundreds of thousands of hours into building yeah. this thing and landing it uh, and now operating it. Um, and so, you know, it's so humbling to be part of something this big, you know, that's, mm -hmm. I always tell people that what's amazing with working on projects like this is that it's bigger than a single person. It's, it's literally yeah. like what we can do as humans, right? Is yes. build something that's bigger than ourselves. Um, and to answer questions like, are we alone? Who are we? Where do we come yes. from? Is that life somewhere else? What is our place in the universe? I mean, it gives me chills just to even think about the fact I, that, me that, too. I to, <laughs> yeah, that I get to be part of this. But, but you know, on a day-to-day, -day, what that translates to is, is excitement. I mean, every yeah. day I go to work, we get new pictures of Mars. Um, this <laughs> week, we're going to be moving the arm for the first time. We're going to be driving for the first time. Uh, we're going to be exploring 
Jezero Crater, which is where we landed, is an ancient dried up lake bed. Uh, and with the, our goal is to drive towards the delta of the old river that used to feed uh, that, uh, um, that lake. And you know, every day I get to hear the scientists like fascinated by the rocks we're seeing, excited to, oh, to wow. share, you know, to figure out what's going on. And, and so it's, it's a pleasure, honestly, from a day to day, it's super exciting. We're, mm -hmm. we're working long hours right now, but I don't yeah. even feel it because of the adrenaline and the, you know, and the, all the cool things that are happening. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Like, uh, it's just cool to hear it, but to honestly, just to see you talk about and how giddy and exciting it is, <laughs> watching someone talk about something that they're so passionate about, there's, that's a whole other level. And now I know as this big astrobiological mission that the goal is to collect some samples um, do you have any idea of, you know, when we may be getting those back so that we can test them or are we still building up to that point? Um, we, we have a little bit of a timeline. Obviously, like, things are dependent on how long it takes us to um, figure out how to land a rocket on another planet to pick up those samples and bring them back. So, you yeah. know, there's, there's some technology we got to figure out somewhere along bit. the way. But, um, but, you know, so our plan on Mars right now is that we're giving ourselves the first Martian year. Um, okay. So that's uh, that's two uh, that's two Earth years uh, okay. to collect a first cache of samples. Uh, gotcha. We you know, we have more a lot of tubes on board. The idea is that we would probably have more than one cache that we would leave in two different places, depending mm -hmm. so that way it gives us options in parallel the mission to go, the, the sample return part of the mission mm -hmm. is already being designed. Um, okay. I think right now they're sort of aiming for a 2026 launch date and okay. a potential return date in the early 2030s. Uh, okay. That probably sounds like really late to, to, you know, to people listening to that, you know, 10 years from now, you're gonna bring this back. In the world of aerospace, that is incredibly fast to have I was to about to say that that's, technology. That's <laughs> promising to me. That makes me excited. <laughs> wow. Um, I think I think realistically, I, I'm personally hoping that in the early 2030s we'll be getting those samples yeah. back. Okay. Uh, and now I know you've been you've been a part of several Mars missions. You've been working with the Red Planet for some time now. What are you most excited about? Well, so short term, what I'm most excited about is is our first flight on Mars. So Perseverance has yes. a little helicopter that's tucked mm -hmm. into its belly. And I actually, as part of one of my jobs, I get to coordinate all the operations of the rover and the helicopter during that technology demonstration. Okay. So so I've been really focused on, on getting that working. But um, and so I am so, so excited to, to see that first flight. We actually are hoping to get that in the next couple of months if it works. Um, yeah. It's a tech demo, we don't know. Uh -huh. uh, but even to just get to be the part of the team that, that is gonna try that, right? Like, isn't that crazy? We've only been flying on earth for about a hundred years and now we're going to Mars and we're try this, right? Um, so, so I think that's, that's uh, what I'm most excited about short-term. I think long-term, you know, this to me, there's been this revival and in interest in space, right? We're seeing all of these uh, private companies develop rockets and, 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 and gathering that interest. Uh, we at NASA have been doing more missions than we ever have before where, you know, Perseverance just landed. We have a mission that's going to launch for Europa in, a, for, in the next few mm -hmm. years to look for life there. We'll be doing sample return. Um, there's just so much going on. And I think to me, that's exciting. I'm excited to see the future of aerospace. I think technology is moving really fast right now. Uh, and who knows, right? Like, I think we're looking towards sending humans back to the moon and maybe eventually to Mars. And, and I'm pretty hopeful that we're going to see all those things in my lifetime. And, and that's going to be quite an extraordinary time. Absolutely. And I'm so glad you bring that up. I was, I was about to ask you what you were excited to see in your lifetime. So you answered that right there. And now I'm also glad you brought up the helicopter. Now, some people, and I know you are from Montreal, so you've experienced it yourself. Um, some people do struggle driving a car alone. <laughs> now, how did you and your guys' team uh, kind of prepare to remotely navigate not only a rover, but a helicopter on a, on a completely different planet? How well, I can I tell you, I can tell you parking on Mars is easier than parking in Montreal. I can start <laughs> with that. No parallel parking on Mars. Yeah. Uh, but um, so, you know, in terms of the helicopter itself, it's it, everything's automated. So okay. we pre-plan everything. We have to have onboard smarts because what happens on Mars is that if I was to send a command to Mars right now, it would take about 12 minutes to get there. And then okay. the response would take 12 minutes helicopter you can't you can't be having these long delays like it yeah. has to be automated so 
So we send in a flight sequence based on you know, what the terrain looks like, what the winds look like, what we know of the environment that day, and it performs that flight. And it, can, it has some onboard smarts to be able to land safely. The rover, we pre-plan everything. Yeah. Um, so the rover has two operations mode. There's one where we make all the plans every night during the Martian night, build all the plans as a team, give it the guidance. Okay, you're gonna turn your wheels this way. You're gonna go five forward, three to the right, whatever mm -hmm. it is. Um, a little bit like, you know, if, if kids who are starting coding, I remember doing that and like building up a code for a little yeah. bit. It's kind of the same, uh, but a little harder, um, but a it's bit. a similar concept. <laughs> Um, but actually, our rover also has the ability to self-drive. Um, so it has an, an additional computer on board uh, that is fully focused on visual navigation. Okay. Um, so what it can do is, you know, we don't have maps on Mars. We don't have GPS. We don't have roads, right? So what it does is as the rover is driving, it takes, um, it takes images five meters in front of it. Okay. And it makes decisions. It, just, it literally builds the map that it's going to drive on. So it okay. takes images. It makes decisions, drives, and then continues to take images as it's driving to make those decisions. So, so that is a capability that we do mm -hmm. have on board and, and we hope to start exercising that again in the next few months because it allows us to um, travel much for, like longer distances in a given day. Otherwise, mm -hmm. when we're planning drives from Earth, we're limited to the imagery we have. Okay. Uh, whereas when you're driving, when you're self-driving, you, can keep, uh, you can keep taking images. That makes sense. Okay. And so that like essentially like a 30 minute delay that how does, how does this actually play out? I know you said that as far as for the helicopter, that's a completely pre-planned pre sequence. Do you mm -hmm. guys um, do it like the day before or you, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So let me explain. So, uh, so what we do is we work during the Martian night. And so right okay. now uh, I, you know, it's, it's six 30 in Los Angeles right now. And in early May, and it's it's gonna it's sorry early March, and then it's it's about um, one a.m. right now on Mars today. Um, now, um, so every night when the rover goes to sleep, um, it sends us a set of uh, set of data and images and things like that. We analyze that, we take all of that, uh, make sure everything happened as we expected, and then we create mm -hmm. a plan as a team. So each okay. person has a responsibility. Someone does the driving, the arm, the um, the instruments. And then mm -hmm. my job is to put all of that together into a master plan, test it and send it up to the rover. We get it up to the rover about 8 a.m. local mm -hmm. Mars time. Um, so we have, for example, for today's plan, a few more hours to get that up and the rover get, wakes up and does its thing. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's how that works. Now the, the challenge for humans uh, to work the Martian night is that a Martian day, which is a sol, is mm -hmm. actually 24 hours and 40 minutes. Uh, oh, wow. which means that even though I start my job every night at about 6 p.m. local Mars mm -hmm. time, uh, my, my day every day on Earth actually shifts by 40 minutes. Um, and so, so, you know, right now I'm working the night shift. Um, <laughs> you know, my day is going to end about 10, 11 a.m. today, wow. uh, but it's going to shift. And by the time we get to next week, I'm actually going to be working the day shift. Um, so we only do this for the first 90 sols, not 90 Martian mm -hmm. days. Um, and it's a 36 day cycle, I, get, mm -hmm. I think, um, when all said and done. Uh, but it also means when you think about it, then in those 90 stalls, I'll lose about two days of my life because, because I'm li yeah. living Martian days. <laughs> that's so intriguing to think of it some, like in this manner. Wow, that's, that's crazy. Now, I can imagine that this can get really stressful. Um, I, I hadn't realized that, that uh, the rover actually has its own system. Does that kind of kick in if there's like an emergency? Like say it it rolls up and there's like a, a giant crater or something that it can't quite navigate. Uh, yeah, so, so you know, when, when the rover is self-driving, if mm -hmm. it gets to a point where it's like, yeah, I don't, I don't really see anywhere safe here, yeah. uh, then it stops uh, gotcha. and it takes images and sends it home. And so, so the rover is built to, um, to always be safe. If it doesn't, okay. if something weird is happening or something's unexpected, it literally, we have a mode called safe mode where it's just yeah. kind of like, how is like in this cocoon and calls home and is like, hey, like help. Um, so, you know, there's, it, it is stressful because it's, it's a huge machine on another planet and there's, there's no like, you know, garage there to fix it yeah. if anything happens. Uh, but we've built in the smarts to protect ourselves from, from any true. issues like that. And, and then we work it on the ground, right? When there's mm -hmm. a, a challenge, we get the data, we work it together and figure it out. 
Absolutely. It's the beauty of having a team and with something yeah. so high risk, high reward, it's, I'm sure it has the pros and cons. Now, can you, I know that you have been active on these Mars missions for so long. Can you tell us some, what, what is the most interesting thing you've learned about the red planet in this time? I know there's probably oh. so much. Oh, I, do you know, I don't know that I can really pick one. So it's, you know, perseverance is only just starting its journey. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's definitely standing on the shoulders of giants of missions before it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's, um, there was a, uh, you know, curiosity and, and the Mars exploration rovers that I think, I think just looking at our journey of understanding of Mars, right? Like we thought Mars was this dead planet. Now we know it has ice caps. We know that it used to have an atmosphere. It used to have liquid water, right? And, and we know that because of these other missions of, of seeing um, MER saw and the Mars exploration rovers saw these, like they call them the blueberries, which are these little okay. rocks that are clearly uh, that are uh, clearly eroded from water. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so it's, I think what is the most fascinating is just like seeing the buildup of our understanding of Mars through these missions and then getting to be part of like the team that answers that next question that, that maybe unlocks that next key, right? That next, yes. um, uh, to, to understanding where Mars comes from, because, because now we actually think that Mars maybe used to look like earth, right? And, and, and now we're starting to ask ourselves questions like, mm -hmm. well, if Mars used to look like Earth, what happened? What was going on yeah. that two billion years ago when it was like Earth? And, and where is it going? Where are we going? So many questions we can learn about Mars's history and our, our possible future. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. I could talk to you for hours. There are so many <laughs> interesting things here. But if you had any, anything that you wanted to say to people or that you wanted to let them know about, is there anything you wanted to add? Oh gosh, I think I think we've covered a lot. Um, yeah, I, you know, I I think my you know my key message is 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 that message of perseverance. I mean, it's yeah. it's kind of ironic that it, it's also the name of the mission, but it's very true. Um, and and you know, w one thing I do want to highlight is we talked about the struggles and the journey, but um, but one thing that I've learned in in all this time is that you know sometimes being different is kind of cool too. It's it's become a really strong asset of mine. I have a different background than everyone. I bring something different to the table Absolutely. and there isn't two people that look like me. And so people will remember me when I step mm -hmm. into a room. So, so I know growing up, that's something that I struggled with a lot. I think when you're, when you're a teenager and a young adult, you don't want to stand out. You just kind of want to yeah. be like everyone else. Um, and so maybe for anyone that's listening, that's maybe going through that. I feel you. I, it, that, you know, it's, it's a tough time, but know that like, turn that into a strength and it will be your strength to, to turn that difference into an asset. So, um, so that's a, that's something that I always love to share because it's an experience that, that I lived in that was difficult for me. Yeah. For anyone listening, I mean, that's so true. It can literally take you to the stars as we, we have seen. Well, again, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Alibe for taking the time to speak with us, to, for telling us about your experiences and the Mars Perseverance missions. I, I truly can't wait to see what you guys come up with next. And I wish you the absolute best of luck um, on this mission and in future missions. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And you have a good one. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye.